It is a sobering and humbling thing to stand here Sunday after Sunday in the spirit of truth, to stand in this pulpit, my words held up by a figure which represents the spirit of truth. Her presence, alas, does not guarantee that what is said in this pulpit is true, but she reminds me that she's there. I am ever conscious that when I get up to speak to you, she will be standing before me, silently urging me, as she urges all who speak here, to speak the truth. The truth as I perceive it, yes, with integrity, with all I know and all I am. The truth as I discern it, responsibly. She continually reminds me of my responsibility to attend to all the evidence, the evidence of my own heart, indeed, and also the objective data which sometimes contradicts the conclusions to which my heart leaps. I have, I am sure, failed her, through overreach and through underreach, in ways that I cannot now see, most of which I will probably never see. Yet, there she is, steadfast and constant in her support of whosoever would address this community Unitarian Church. According to our historical records, this pulpit has been at this congregation for 90 years. Ever since 1925, this spirit of truth has stood encouragingly bearing the load of the messages of this congregation's six settled ministers, all the interim ministers, the ministerial interns, the guest ministers, and a long, long list of guest speakers and lay members who have spoken here. On this Martin Luther King Day weekend, as we celebrate what would have been Dr. King's 86th birthday, it is particularly pertinent to remember the urgings of the spirit of truth, Race-based distrust, prejudice, and bigotry continues to bedevil and rive our nation, our world, too, but I must say, especially our nation. The ways we lie to ourselves and each other, the ways we are in denial, place us in sore need of the spirit of truth. The first balm for the wounds of division is truth. The bandages of programs, the splints of institutions, and the sutures of social justice will fail without the salve of truth. The awareness of what is so, shared knowledge of how things are. Let us begin with the truth about our history, for that will help us understand why racial harmony is so particularly difficult for this country. America did not invent prejudice or discrimination against people that, in any physical way, including skin color, looked different. But we did invent the modern conception of race and the racism based upon that conception. By the spirit of truth, let us understand where this conception comes from. The word race used to mean any other group of people. If you lived in northern France, the people a couple hundred miles south of you were a southerly race. Protestants referred to the Catholic race and vice versa. Nobles spoke of the peasant race. The emergence of the modern sense of race was a deliberate device of the wealthy landowners in the colonies in the 1600s. Much of the manual agricultural labor of the colonies at first was done by what we would now call white indentured servants. England's anti-poverty program of the time was to make poverty a crime, punishable by deportation to America, essentially as a slave, but with the provision for earning one's freedom after 10 or 20 
or sometimes as much as 30 years of labor. From what we can tell, when African slaves began showing up to work beside them in the field, the darker skin color aroused no particular animosity. Whether you had paler skin or darker skin, you were kept in separate quarters, supervised by an overseer, whipped as a means of correction, often underfed and underclothed, and stereotyped as vile and brutish and subhuman. The two groups, both despised objects of the contempt of the bourgeoisie, saw each other as sharing the same predicament. As historian Edmund Morgan notes, it was common, for example, for servants and slaves to run away together, steal hogs together, get drunk together. It was not uncommon for them to make love together. End quote. And sometimes, European servants combined with African slaves to rebel against the ruling elite. The main difference was from the point of view of the masters. The workers that came from Africa cost more, but they paid off in the long run because you didn't have to release them after a certain period of time, and as an additional bonus, you also owned their children. For that reason, the slave demand brought a steady increase in African slave populations through the late 1600s. That trend combined, as time went by and the indentured served out their time, with more and more European-born poor freedmen in the population. Only then did the masters begin to draw the sort of race line that today is so familiar to us. They did it as a strategy against rebellion. The freedmen were persons without house or land, rankled by unfair taxes, the greed of legislators who, then as now, were in the pockets of the wealthy, and land use regulations that made it very difficult for them to ever own land. Freedmen with disappointed hopes and slaves of desperate hope were joining forces to mount ever more virulent rebellions. The landowner's strategy was to invent American racism as we know it. Whereas previously the big divide was between the vile rabble over here and the landowners over there, the new way of grouping people encouraged the European-born part of the rabble to think of themselves as white as sharing something crucial with the landowners, which the African-born did not. Thus, the freedmen were co-opted into betraying their own economic self-interest to support the landowners' interests, with which they identified by virtue of their shared whiteness. It was a brilliant divide-and-keep-conquered strategy to separate dangerous free whites from dangerous slave blacks by a screen of racial contempt. The trick was accomplished by such means as passing new laws, offering some protections to whites even while still indentured. As of 1705, in Virginia, any Negro slave could be given 30 lashes on the bare back, but it was forbidden to whip a Christian white servant naked. The whipping happened, but the extra indignity did not, which helped the indentured begin to learn to be white, to identify with their oppressors against the even more oppressed. That same year, 1705, horses, cattle, and hogs were confiscated from slaves and sold to benefit poor whites. Any white was given the right to whip a black servant or slave. Slave owners were urged to bar their black slaves from learning the skills of a trade in order to preserve that work for white artisans. In ways subtle and obvious, a dignity based on whiteness alone was created where nothing of the sort had been imagined 50 years before. The gap between the wealthy and poor widened as a result of slave productivity, 
Thus, the sense that poor whites now shared status and dignity with their social betters was largely illusory. But that illusion was powerful. Being white meant despising blacks, which afforded this illusory dignity that kept poor whites from agitating for economic reform on their own behalf, and instead adopting attitudes and behavior to assist the landowners in keeping the blacks down. We carry that legacy today. Many of the whites among us, if you think back, you'll be able to tell a story of how you learned to be white. I'm talking about stories like Dan's. In college during the late 1950s, Dan joined a fraternity. With his prompting, his local chapter pledged a black student. When the chapter's national headquarters learned of this first step toward integration of its ranks, headquarters threatened to rescind the local chapter's charter unless the black student was expelled. The local chapter caved in to the pressure, and Dan was elected to tell the black student he would have to leave the fraternity. Dan did it with tremendous shame. Or stories like Sarah's. At age 16, Sarah brought her best friend home with her from high school. After the friend left, Sarah's mother told her not to invite her friend home again. Why? Sarah asked, astonished and confused. Because she's colored, her mother responded. Sarah thought, what kind of reason was that? for not inviting her to Sarah's house. So Sarah persisted, insisting that her mother tell her the real reason for her action. None was forthcoming. The indignant look on her mother's face, however, made Sarah realize that if she persisted, she would jeopardize her mother's affection toward her. Or stories like mine. I was a timid first grader in North Carolina when one day on the school bus, a big third grader asked me if I liked President Johnson. And I shrugged. What did I know about President Johnson? And the big kid said he didn't like Johnson because he lets, and here he used the N word, go to our school. The look of contempt upon his face made me feel such a relief to not be the object of that contempt. I learned to be white on that day. I was whited by a system invented in this country two and a half centuries before by landowners who wanted to suppress rebellion, a system that took on a life of its own and long outlived its original purpose. We are all wounded by the race line that slashes across our psyches, whatever side of that line we may think we're on. Once the race line has been established, there's a projection that occurs. Learning to be white means learning to project upon darker-skinned people everything in us that feels low, vile, or shameful. A constant, nagging sense of unworthiness is part of the deal. Here, you get to be white like the rich folks, but you can't help notice that you're still poor, so maybe you're not really worthy of your whiteness. The more whites were made to feel unworthy, the more they projected unworthy qualities on the group they were allowed to, and told to, despise. The more whites internalized that message, you're white, so if you just work hard enough, you're bound to be okay, the more they projected upon blacks the laziness they feared in themselves. White racism against blacks is always a version of self-disgust adopted in a desperate attempt to hold on to worth and dignity in the face of exclusion from the upper classes. This begins to explain a few mysteries. Martin Luther King brought his war on slums to Chicago 
for his 1965 campaign for open housing. The hostility of the white mobs King and his nonviolent protesters faced as they began their walk through the white Gage Park and Chicago Lawn neighborhoods literally stunned him. Rocks and bricks were thrown, one of which struck King on the temple. What could account for this intensity of hostility from whites whose every economically visible interest was unthreatened? Why were the lower and middle class whites more virulently racist than the upper class whose interests were more directly challenged? Because if worth and dignity didn't come from whiteness, they just weren't sure where it could come from. Over and over, a substantial portion of whites' lower and middle class voters vote against their own self-interest and in favor of wealthy interests. That doesn't happen in most other countries in the world. Why does it happen here? Because here is where the idea of being white, that is, learning to distance yourself from the interests that blacks would have, even if in reality you did share those interests, was invented. White has meant identifying with the wealthy, identifying with a shared paleness over and against shared economic needs. Why is the U.S. unable to enact a fairer, more effective, and even cheaper health care system, a single-payer government national health insurance, while Europe and Canada and Japan have this eminently sensible system? It's because the U.S.'s specific heritage of racism taught us to identify with the wealthy, and the wealthy don't need national health insurance. Why is the U.S. unable to provide adequate public schooling, affordable housing for all, and progressive taxation? It's because the U.S.'s specific heritage of racism taught us to identify with the wealthy, and the wealthy send their kids to private schools, aren't at risk of homelessness, and don't want to be progressively taxed. Why is it that when black men open-carried firearms, as the Black Panthers did in the 1960s and 70s, gun control legislation passed, and when that perceived threat was gone and whites wanted to open-carry, those controls were rolled back, and white people heavily armed in public are celebrated as patriotic and freedom-loving? Why is it that the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 created much harsher penalties for possession of crack cocaine used mostly by blacks than for a quantity of powdered cocaine used mostly by whites that produced similar effects. It's because the national psyche has developed the long-standing habit of projecting upon dark skin color everything it is scared of and is unconsciously convinced that whatever the black people are doing must be suppressed. Why is it that the percentage of African Americans in prison is almost six times higher than the percentage of European Americans in prison? Why is it that a young black male is 21 times more likely to be shot by police than his white counterpart? Why is it that otherwise identical resumes yield a 50% greater chance of being invited for an interview if the applicant's name is stereotypically white than if the name is stereotypically black? Why is it that black renters learn about 11% fewer rental units and black home buyers are shown about one-fifth fewer homes? Why is it that blacks and whites use illegal drugs at the same rate, but African Americans are arrested on drug charges at three times higher rates? I think we know. Unitarian Universalists have struggled with this legacy. In the 19th century, Unitarians were at the forefront of the abolition movement. We are proud of that. A century later, many of us were likewise in the forefront of the civil rights movement. 
among the 30,000 who marched with Dr. King in Selma in 1965 were about 500 Unitarian Universalist lay people and about 250 UU ministers. The ministers who went to Selma represented a quarter to a third of all UU ministers in full fellowship. Add to that the dozens who spent time with the Mississippi Summer Project, the Delta Ministry Project, and other efforts in the South afterward, those who led their community's response, and the dozen ministers who participated in the UU presence in Selma throughout the summer of 1965. It isn't a stretch to estimate that half of the 710 UU ministers in full fellowship were actively engaged in this struggle. We are proud of that, too. Yet, we have not always been noble. In the 1920s, the first two African-American Unitarian ministers, Ethel Red Brown and Louis McGee, both encountered continual discouragement and resistance from the denominational leaders at the time who saw no place for a black man in the pulpits of their predominantly white congregations. In 1968, just three years after so many Unitarian Universalists had transformative experiences in Selma, our General Assembly was torn apart over race issues. Our denomination, through the years, has launched a number of initiatives to raise the consciences of UUs on race and encourage racial diversity in our congregations. In 1996, the program called Journey Toward Wholeness began. In response, the minister of this congregation at the time, Reverend Shannon Bernard, called together a group of church members who began what we call In the Spirit of Truth. In the Spirit of Truth has been meeting on the first Sunday of every month now for 19 years. In the year and a half that I have been here, I have joined them about half the time. We sit in a circle, pass the talking stick around, and take turns sharing our thoughts and our feelings about any form of bigotry or prejudice. There may be a particular issue or episode from history or the recent news that serves as a topic for the day, or there may not be. The name, in the spirit of truth, comes from the recognition of the need to learn to speak the truth to each other as we perceive the truth without fear of censure, to listen to uncomfortable feelings below it, and to see ourselves in others, to see others as ourselves, and to gain insights into the experiences of others which would help us to live our principles in an increasingly diverse world. For Nearly 20 years now, In the Spirit of Truth has been gathering in this building, providing a context for participants to share how they have experienced the racial divide, or, as the project expanded, any divide based on prejudice or that produces discrimination. For those who speak in this pulpit, the spirit of truth stands visibly before them. For those who gather in her name on the first Sunday of the month, she is embodied in the faces and the words and the hearts, the broken and healing, bleeding and living, shining hearts of those who speak, listen, and hold one another respectfully, no matter what is said. In that sharing, surprised sometimes by what we hear our own voice saying, or by what we hear others saying, we learn 
our truth. We connect with others through their truth and the healing of the wounds of racism. Wounds inflicted by a divide-and-subjugate strategy of landowners more than 300 years ago begins. The bandages of programs, the splints of institutions, or the sutures of social justice will fail without the salve of truth, the awareness of what is so, shared knowledge of how things are. It's the first Sunday of every month. The next meeting will be on February 1st. If you have not been a part of In the Spirit of Truth, or if you haven't for a while, for your own sake and for all our sakes, go, participate, be moved, perhaps to tears, and begin to be healed. May it be so. Amen.